They all break my the whole break.
Good evening and welcome to Community Candid. I'm Dr. Christina Griffin. I'm the Associate Dean of Institutional Effectiveness and Quality for LBW. We are excited about the launch of our lecture series and we hope that you do gain meaningful information. If you have not done so, please make sure that you have registered online or have signed it in the lobby. 
We have tons of gifts to give away this evening at the end of our presentation, so make sure you stay. In the lobby, you may have noticed several community vendors. Please make sure that you browse that area, have a conversation, or pick up some freebies that are offered. If you have any questions, please feel free to stop a member of our LBW family. I'd like to introduce to you our president, Dr. Brock Kelly. Dr. Kelly has been the president of LBW for the last three years. During his time, he has made great strides to ensure that LBW is not just a traditional community college, but one that serves as a resource center to provide educational options and avenues for everyone, regardless of their perceived barriers. With his leadership, LBW has been able to change lives in and out of the classrooms, on and off of our campuses. His vision and dedication to the community have proven to change the way community colleges are viewed across Alabama. And now a word from our president. Good evening. On behalf of our institution and its president, I welcome everyone to tonight's kickoff of Community Candidate. In the fall of 2021, I established a group of community leaders from our service area to come together to have a meaningful discussion about diversity and how LBW could remove bona fide barriers as well as artificial and perceived barriers. The first meeting, Dr. Griffin, my co-chair of this committee, and I challenged each member of the committee to think and view diversity in more ways than just race and ethnicity. We wanted to evaluate socioeconomic status, cultural differences, cognitive abilities, as well as differences in perception. Throughout the year, we learned more than we ever thought we would on perception of college in general, and the perception of LBW through the eyes of the community. We realized we at LBW needed to be more visible and approachable. We needed to be a resource to the community, more so than just an institute of higher learning. Through multiple meetings and social events, the community leaders on diversity began to brainstorm ways LBW could help foster individuals in our service area. The committee was instrumental in providing feedback to get us to where we are today. And today I'm proud to say we can unveil Community Candidate. Our hope is that the next two months are insightful and educational to all modern day parents. Our hope is that you gain knowledge about specific topics and learn about additional resources within our community and surrounding areas. I'd be remiss if I did not recognize the members of my community leaders on diversity committee. If you are a member of this committee, please stand to be recognized. I want to thank you for your commitment to LBW and your community. If you're on the internal subcommittee who are, was responsible in making tonight happen, please stand to be recognized. I think everybody's just working. Uh, I'm supposed to stand right there. Um, but once again, it's my honor to welcome you to LBW, our campus. Um, it, it's an honor to serve. It's an honor to be a part of this community, and uh, I hope tonight you leave armed with useful information um, and a sense of release and knowing that we're all in this together and face the same challenges. Um, but the last group I want to recognize is all parents. If you're a parent trying to navigate an ever-changing society, uh, you're, you're committed to be it, about being here. And I want everyone as a parent stand to be recognized. Before I leave and turn it over uh, to Dr. Griffin again, uh, I want to mention the sign-in sheet. That sign-in sheet is important um, for numerous reasons. Uh, so uh, we are also at the end of the uh, five or five sessions, two months. Uh, we're giving away a five thousand dollar cash scholarship to LBW. So we're, we want people to come. We want people to learn. And uh, we welcome you to LBW, and thanks, and uh, welcome to the family. Good evening. Um, I'm so glad that y'all are here tonight. My name is Katie King. I am the director of 
student activities and community engagement here at OMW. And I have the privilege and honor of introducing our um, speaker this evening. When we started this process, we really wanted to bring the best of the best and an expert on each of our topics. And this is um, certainly going to prove true tonight. Uh, we have an Andalusian native here tonight. Um, she grew up with born, born and raised. Yes, born and raised here in Andalusia. And to have her back here um, in such an impactful way is really important. So um, I'm very privileged to get to um, introduce Ms. Whitney Queen. Whitney is the president, co-founder, and managing partner of Mentoro, a financial education company. Since its inception, Whitney has focused on the strategic success and development of the solution, fulfilling her passion to solve the retirement crisis. I think that's all important to all of us. She works to share Mentoro's vision with clients, partners, and the industry at large. Whitney manages the corporate direction, facilitating partnerships, and overseeing de departmental activity in technology, sales, marketing, education, and operations. With a desire to understand what drives a brand, Whitney attended the University of Alabama, where she studied advertising, psychology, and computer science. Whitney later obtained her Master's of Science in International Marketing from Boston University. In 2019, she completed the invitation-only Behavioral Sciences Executive Education Program from the UCLA John E. Anderson Graduate School of Management. While her background is in marketing, having spent her early career working in advertising in New York, Whitney found her home in financial services in 2015. Whitney's also the co-host of a new podcast called Run With the Bulls, which discusses everyday finances with everyday people. She was recently recognized as one of the top global leaders in finance and featured on the cover of Manage HR Magazine for Mentoro as the top emerging financial wellness company. Whitney lives in Atlanta with her husband and is a lover of the arts, history, and travel. That's quite an introduction. Um, that's pretty amazing to me. So y'all um, be, uh, be attentive and it, uh, we will have a Q&A after Whitney speaks as well. So if you have any questions, you can jot those down and she'll be happy to answer those. But I'm gonna turn it over to the expert. So Whitney. Thank you, Katie. That's why it sounds me, it makes me sound way more cool than I am. <laughs> But uh, I want to thank you all for being here. I am uh, very excited to speak with you. So I'd like to start with a quote. A penny saved is two pins clear. A pen a day is a growth a year. Save and have every little makes a middle. Now that's a quote from Benjamin Franklin, a Renaissance nerd and founding father. You may recognize him as having drafted part of the Declaration of Independence as well as being one of its signers. You may also recognize him for one of his brilliant inventions, which would be something like the Franklin stove, the lightning rod, or five ripples. But not many people know his involvement with money, at least not outside of his faith being on the $100 bill, <laughs> right? So uh, he actually helped design, if not fully designed, the first US penny in 1787. Raise up hands who knew that. Yes. All right. <laughs> so what's really interesting about that is um, what was emblazoned on that penny. So uh, each of you received a penny as you walked in, or I hope you did, and I'm sure you wondered why. But if you'll pull that penny out and look on the back, you'll see that it says E Pluribus Unum, which loosely means uh, one out of many makes sense for the penny, right? But that's not what it said on the 1787 penny. Uh, ben Franklin had emblazoned on that 1787 penny, mind your business. Mind your business. A little snarky, perhaps, but also quite poignant, if you think about it. And really, when you think about Ben Franklin, he also said, nothing is certain except for death and taxes. So I think it's safe to say maybe he knew what he was talking about. When we talk about money, and when we think about money, we realize how quickly it becomes very personal to us. In fact, I don't really hear people shouting to the rooftops that they're up to their eyeballs in debt. And yet, uh, the average American is $96,000 in debt. I do hear, however, a lot of people talking about <laughs> what they would do in retirement. Once they retire, they're gonna go to the beach, they're gonna play golf, all these things. And yet, we're in the midst of a retirement crisis in which one in four people is not adequately prepared for retirement. And sadly, 
Uh, the third leading cause of divorces in this country is money-related disagreements, equaling about 22% of all divorces. We do not like to talk about the hard parts of money. Seems a bit of a contradiction when you think about the emphasis that we place on our social reputation. Social media, or living the life, right? And especially the money that goes into building up that social reputation. But I think that it's more than that. I think it's something much deeper, actually. I, th I think it's not about ego. It's about um, the fact that we probably don't know as much about money as we should. We don't have a thorough understanding of money or how it works. So tonight, uh, my goal is to share with you guys the major principles of money with the hope that you leave just a little bit wiser than the way you came in and as you embark on your journey towards financial freedom. A uh, penny saved is two pence clear. That's the quote I started with. Um, that quote suggests that the difference between a wise person and a foolish person is just two pennies. Why? Because the fool is always going to pay more. Another way maybe to think about that is that uh, if you spend, um, excuse me, uh, a penny spent is a penny learned, a penny saved is a penny earned. So that's maybe a, a more favorable way to think about that quote. But tonight as we go through these different concepts, we're going to channel that of the 1787 penny. Um, thinking about Ben Franklin embarking on American independence, the wisdom we want to take about that, and uh, the fact that we need to mind our business. And then the other from today's penny, which is that there are several ways to interpret personal finance. What I'm going to talk about tonight is just one of many. So, uh, as Katie said, my name is Whitney Queen. I am the co-founder and president of a uh, money mentorship company called Mentoro. And as this quote says, I do believe in empowering people to take control of their financial situations. My goal is very simple, as I stated. I seek to improve financial literacy through providing education, consultations, and resources. So I'd like to start, if you guys could raise your hand, who has heard of the concept of financial wellness? All right, fantastic. So then you guys all know that financial wellness is whatever you want it to be. Financial wellness means something different to everyone. It's a concept, it's not a definitive term. Uh, but, to help those of you who may not be as familiar with financial wellness, I have put together some impact statements that may help you guide uh, your understanding of it. So the first is that it's a position of health, not wealth. Let's think about someone who makes $50,000 a year and only spends $30,000. Pretty good standing. Now let's compare them to somebody who makes $100,000 a year and spends $105,000. Not very healthy. It has nothing to do with the amount of money you have. It has to do with what you do with that money. The second is that it's a process, not an event. Kind of like when you're uh, trying to get healthy and maybe say you want to lose some weight, you can go to bed and wake up the next morning and expect to be thin and fit. It would be amazing if that was the case, but that is unfortunately not the case and it's the same with your finances. So it's a process, not an event. It's something that you have to work at. It's a lifestyle. The third is addressing your stress by having a plan in place. Money-related stress is one of the top indicators of stress, and I don't think I need to tell any of you what stress does to our bodies. It's not good. So having a plan helps to alleviate that stress and make things much, much easier. The fourth is controlling your money and not letting it control you. I like to think of dollars sometimes as five-year-olds. If you don't tell them what to do, it gets a little chaotic. If you don't tell your money what to do, it gets a little chaotic. So it's best to have control of it instead of the other way around. And then the final one is my personal favorite, and that is having the knowledge and confidence to make informed financial decisions. So there's nothing more powerful than having a solid understanding of what you're doing and what you want to do and then feeling the confidence behind making that decision. So I'd like to keep you, uh, I'd like you rather to keep these things in mind as we talk through our concepts tonight. To further prove my point, 
on financial wellness, here are some interesting stats. 59% of Americans admitted to living paycheck to paycheck. 59%. That's wild. 64% of these same individuals can't meet a $400 emergency expense. They would have to put it on credit, they would have to borrow it, or they simply wouldn't be able to meet the needs of that emergency. 18% of that same group actually make an annual salary larger than $100,000 a year. Wow. That kind of goes back to that, uh, it's not a, a matter of wealth, it's a matter of health, doesn't it? So tonight we're gonna take a little bit of a journey, again, going through the seven money basics. And we're gonna get started with one of the easiest. So if you tune me out after this one, a-okay, but do me a favor and listen to this next one because it holds a lot, of, a lot of good keys. So these are the ones we'll be going through here. Spending, saving, debt, retirement, protection, legacy, and wealth. So the first is spending. So similar to our health, we just made an example about that. It's very easy to say, uh, eat less than you burn, spend less than you earn. And yet we have 59% of people living paycheck to paycheck, and we might have a problem with obesity in this country as well. But the good thing is, if we have that understanding as to why that's the case, perhaps we can change it. I think that there are two struggles with spending that we face. The first is understanding. We don't know how much money we have, or we don't realize that we're living beyond our means. The second is behavior. Uh, we don't understand our relationship with money. For example, if you grew up in a house uh, where one of your parents was a miser and never let you have anything that you wanted, uh, then you might grow up and turn in two, two different directions. One would be you'd be just like that parent and you'd be a miser afraid to spend money, or you would go crazy and you would have lots of five-year-olds making a lot of chaos, right? So let's understand why maybe that's the case. To help us get a, a better understanding of our spending, it's the dreaded B word. It's not our favorite, but we must have it, right? It's budgeting. And there are four main ways that you can set up a budget, or at least these are the four most common, and so I'll walk you guys through those. You have the 50-30-20 the rule, which is 50% goes to needs, 30% to wants, 20% to savings. Now, the most important part about this is that you are sitting down and acknowledging that you want to set aside a set amount or a set percentage of your income to go towards certain things. That way you can book all of your expenses into different categories and plan them out from there. If you need to adjust that from being 30% on wants to 25% on wants so that you can put 25% into savings, so be it. The point is that you understand where your money is going. Another is the zero-based budget. And this is basically when you take your total income and you subtract all of your expenses to where it equals zero. And this is a very common tool and a very easy tool if you already have a set income and you already have set expenses. Because it's very easy to start at the top, subtract everything out, and what you have left, you can allocate to other places, like savings or like discretionary spending. So then the third is probably something that seems um, a very old school maybe, that's the envelope budget. So this could be likened to maybe mattress money, if anybody did that back in the day. Uh, but the point of it is that you would take discretionary cash and you would put it into different envelopes each month. And once you spent the money within those envelopes, that's it. You don't spend anything else. So that way, it's more of kind of the bird in the hand um, that you are using what you have right there instead of expensing it or maybe uh, allowing it to get out of control. And the fourth, uh, let's say you don't want to really mess with those three. Uh, you don't really have the time, or maybe it's more complex for you than you'd like. It is 2023, and there are lots of digital systems that can do it for you, um, where you can integrate all of your accounts. It'll take a look at your trends. So if it sees that you're spending $1,000 a month on your mortgage, for example, it's gonna make a note of that in your budget and automatically put that into the budget for you, right? So it makes it nice and easy. The point is, 
whichever of these that you choose or whichever that you create on your own, it's that you're taking control and you're um, having a better understanding of your finances so that you can not only see what's coming and going, but also so you can plan ahead, right? You can do this on a pen and paper, you can do it in an Excel spreadsheet, whatever it is, it also makes for a great foundation to have conversations. We go back to that leading cause of divorce being disagreements. If you have it on paper, way easier for that paper to say that someone is wrong than you to say that they're wrong. Or way easier to let the math tell you that maybe um, you should cut back on spending, right? Uh, it's also a good tool to have if you, if you have aging children. Um, so let's say your children are getting prepared to go off to college or they're in college, uh, trying to get started out on their own. Set aside a budget with them. And, and help them start to have those healthy conversations. If your children are younger, the envelope budget is a great place to start because they can take money that they earn from side jobs or from chores around the house, put that into those envelopes, and they can start to build those habits early on. And the final is if you have aging parents, if you are lucky enough to be in what we call the sandwich generation, where you are doing the juggle struggle of taking care of aging parents and growing children, uh, this is not only something that will help you stay organized, but something that you can have those conversations with your aging parents as well. All right. So that second struggle that we talked about was related to our relationship with behavior. And as Katie mentioned in my bio, I did spend some time at UCLA uh, working under Shlomo Benarnsi. I won't ask you guys to say his name because it's kind of tricky. But uh, he and Richard Thaler are kind of noted as the kings of behavioral finance. That's right, we have also psychoanalyzed money. <laughs> so, um, the really good part about this is that it does help give us a lot of information in understanding why we do what we do. Um, there's a book here on the screen, it's called Nudge. It's a great book, it's good for all ages. Um, if you would like your kids to read it, you yourself, um, anybody here who might be a teacher at the college would be a great book for your uh, students to read, um, but any overachiever, I would highly recommend it. Um, I'm going to summarize it for you guys into a little seventh grade science class real quick. Uh, and that's that I'm going to start with the principles of inertia, myopia, and loss aversion. So inertia, as you guys remember, is resistance, it's friction, it's the unwillingness to change. And an example of that and how it relates to our relationship is money, uh, with money is we just sweep that credit card debt right under the rug. We uh, pretend that it doesn't exist. We go right to the store. We swipe that card again. We don't want to face it, right? The second is myopia. And so for those of you who knew my dad, who is an optometrist, and I'm sure right now he is loving that I'm using the word myopia, but myopia means nearsighted. So that's the ability, or the inability rather, to see yourself in the future. A great example of that is delayed retirement. So as a young person, uh, let's assume I'm 22, I'm just getting started, and I get this new job, HR says, hey, we offer this great 401k, you should start contributing. Well, that feels like money that's coming out of my paycheck, and so I'm going to say, no thanks, i got a long time until I retire, I'm going to put that off into the future. Well, all of a sudden you blink and you wake up and you're 50. And maybe you did, maybe you didn't. Hopefully you did contribute. But unfortunately in a lot of cases, people do not. Because they have this misconception that there's more time. Right? Uh, and then the third is loss aversion. Uh, this is one of my personal favorites because um, I liken it to being kind of like the stepsister to risk tolerance. So has anyone taken a risk tolerance test before? Okay, so a risk tolerance test is something that you might take in, um, if you're working with a financial advisor and you're trying to understand your, um, your tolerance for investments. Do you want to be more risky or do you want to be more conservative? Well, for me personally, that's a pretty abstract concept. And it's, it's hard for me to really wrap my mind around how I would feel about that. So I like to look at it in terms of loss. So let's imagine we're walking down the street and we find a $100 bill. 
We look around, no one's there. We think, okay, maybe it's my lucky day. I just found hundred dollars, right? Feels amazing. But what if you're that person that dropped hundred dollars? Doesn't feel so great, you just lost hundred dollars. In fact, science will tell us that people feel pain two to two and a half times more than they feel again. That means it's going to hurt worse that you lost it, that it feels good that you got it, right? So um, loss aversion, we kind of tie that back to spending as not really knowing your threshold. And so rather than it feeling like you're going to lose something, let's flip the script and say, perhaps if we spent less, we would feel less pain because our bank account would be happier, right? I also liken it to uh, the concept of FOMO. So the younger folks in the crowd may know what FOMO is. It's a term kind of like YOLO, it's a little silly, but it means fear of missing out. So you end up spending money, you go to places, you do things purely based off the fear that you might miss out, not really because you want to. And we waste a lot of money doing things like that. So again, I like to flip that and say JOMO, the joy of missing out. The joy of keeping that money in your pocket. The joy of staying at home and enjoying the things that you've already spent money on. <laughs> Not, again, the easiest thing to do, but maybe a different concept to think about. So what are some ways to spend less? Well, first, I encourage you guys to ask yourself questions. So channel your inner Marie Kondo and think minimalistically here and ask yourself, do I need this? Do I want it more than the things that I need? And is this going to bring me joy? Is it worth what I'm paying for it? If you can't answer that question, you probably shouldn't be buying it. The second is track your spending. We talked about budgeting. So being able to look at things on paper, you may realize you get out a lot more during the week than you think you do. And you could save a lot of money, a lot of money if you packed your lunch. And the third is trim the fat. Get rid of the excess. Um, maybe you have more subscriptions for streaming services that you're not using. Maybe you um, don't buy generic at the grocery store. You always buy, you know, the top brand. Do they really taste different? I don't know. Um, but those are areas and ways that you could look at things differently and try to trim the fat so that you spend a little less. So we'll move on to the next subject, which is the big brother to spending less, and that's saving. So I like to talk about savings in terms of um, something that's aspirational, something that uh, feels good to do. And there are kind of four main reasons as to why, or at least four that I would say, and I like to call them the four P's of saving. So the four are possibilities, protection, purchases, and preparation. So starting with possibilities. If you have savings, you now have options. Let's say you don't really like that job anymore, and maybe you want to go back to school here at LBW. It would help to have some savings. Um, maybe you want to start a side gig, but you need a down payment to do so. You would need some savings. Uh, the next is protection. So the best way to protect yourself with savings is by having an emergency fund. And a rule of thumb is to have three to six months of expenses saved. Now, there's a, lot of, um, there's a lot of opinion on what you should use with your emergency fund, but I say it's whatever you deem as an emergency. Uh, for me, it was when my air conditioner went out in July of 2020. It was a very big emergency for me, and I was really thankful that I had an emergency fund to pull from. But also, in all seriousness, looking at 2020, that was a really hard year for a lot of people, not just on the health front. People were losing their jobs, companies were having to lay people off, they were having to do furloughs, and a lot of people were in a really big bind. And having an emergency fund can be a way to help protect yourself in the future should something like that happen again. Purchases. We all like to make big purchases. Um, so you would need savings to buy a home, to buy a car, to go on vacation. There are a lot of big things that we have coming up and it seems like those things keep getting more and more expensive. So having the savings will help you be able to attain those goals. And then the fourth, preparation. We're all gonna hit family milestones. Birth, death, weddings, all of it. And all of those things cost money. 
So if you can have savings, then you can better prepare for those life events so that whether they're happy or sad, uh, money or the lack thereof is not causing extra stress. Ways to save more. Start small. Less really is more. So if you practice the first step of spending less, you immediately have saved more. It's very easy. But the second is maybe you could consider investing. Build on the savings you do have. Uh, take a look at short-term savings that you might need versus long-term savings. And if something falls more in the long-term uh, bucket, maybe consider investing that in the stock market. We'll talk a little bit about that later. And then the third is plan ahead. The early bird really does get the worm. If you know you're going on a trip, don't wait until the day before to book the flight. It's probably gonna be more expensive. Book it when you know that you're gonna travel so that you get the best deal. And that same principle applies across the board. Okay, so I'll give you guys a heads up. This next one tends to um, spark a collective gasp and an eye roll. So just take a deep breath. We'll get through it together. It's the D word. The B word's not sounding that bad all of a sudden. It's debt. So what is debt? Debt can simply be understood as the amount owed by the borrower to the lender. It's very simple. And yet it's such a big monster in so many of our lives. Um, a lot of people think that all debt is bad debt, but I am not one of those people. You can form your own opinion, but I would say in this day and age, it's nearly impossible not to leverage debt. The important part is that we think about Ben Franklin's statement and that we make sure we do it wisely so that we don't become the fool. So to give you an idea of what maybe some good debts would be, these are things that uh, build value, they appreciate over time, or they're gonna lead to return in the future so that you get back your investment. This would be things like student loans, mortgages, maybe investing in a small business or investing in your future. Uh, versus bad debt, that's things that depreciate. So that'd be like a car, a vacation, an experience. Those are things that either start to lose value or as soon as they occur, there is no more value, you will not get the return that you put into them more than one. <coughs> so we can't really talk about debt without talking about credit, right? So um, it's important though to uh, discern the difference between the two. So credit is, credit is the money that you borrow. The amount that you borrow is debt. Does that make sense? So credit, in essence, is your financial power. And it all kind of rolls up into this very antiquated three-digit financial reputation known as your credit score. Your credit score ranges from uh, 300 to 800, um, and that's very poor to excellent credit. I would say the average person tends to fall somewhere between fair and good. Um, but what you would want to aspire to is having anywhere between good and excellent. Otherwise, you're gonna start seeing ramifications. So what makes up the credit score? That's your credit worthiness. And there are different qualifications that build your credit worthiness. It has to do with utilization, payment history, all of these different things that go into your kind of file as a debtor that help to build that credit score so that when you go to take debt in the future, that a lender knows whether or not they can trust you. It's really what it boils down to, is are you trustworthy enough for me to lend you this money and trust that you'll pay it back? So let's say maybe you have a little bit lower credit score. Um, you might feel some impacts of that because you don't have as good credit, and so you're just gonna end up paying more for your debt than the average person, because your interest rate is probably going to be higher. So we could probably have a whole lecture on credit. I'll, I'll pause there, maybe we can answer some questions at the end, but um, it's extremely important to have an idea as to what your credit score is, the things that make, make that credit score, um, or make up your credit worthiness, so that when and if you have to leverage good debt, or even in the case that you might have to leverage bad debt, you have the ability to do so um, at a fair enough rate that you, can, um, that you can absorb. If you do not already, I would highly suggest that you get uh, an online account with creditkarma.com or annualreport.com. 
so that you can see what your credit score is. Take a look at what's on there. You may have something that doesn't even apply to you or something that you paid off years ago that's still hanging around on there. People do make mistakes, so check and make sure you don't have those mistakes hanging around on your credit report. You can also, anytime your credit is pulled, ask for the person who pulled your credit to give you a copy. Let's say you go and get an apartment. You have to have your credit pulled for that. So ask the person if they can give you a copy of that so that you can see it there. Okay? All right. A little bit more on credit. Um, just to touch on really things that are not as much credit as they are kind of interest rates and utilizing um, credit and things associated with it. And that would be um, first interest rates. We touched on that a little bit earlier. So the interest rate is the amount that you're charged on top of what you borrowed. Okay, it's a percentage assigned. But say the average for credit cards these days is between 18 and 24 percent. We've seen here with mortgages over the last few years, they've dropped in, uh, incredibly low, um, and now they're starting to hike back up. Maybe they'll go back down, we'll see. But all of that really means is the amount that you're going to pay on top of what it actually costs that you're buying. So if you're if you have a credit card, let's say you're going to go get some food. Let's say you get McDonald's. It's a $5 hamburger, and you put it on the credit card. If you don't pay that off when your statement rolls around, then you're not really paying $5 for that hamburger. You're paying a lot more for it. And was it worth more than $5? I don't know. Maybe you really like it. But something to consider whenever you go to use uh, your credit card. There's always going to be a repercussion for that borrowed money. So you want to make sure that you keep the interest rate in mind whenever you're making purchases in whatever way that it is that you're taking on debt because it's just kind of come right back around. Um, on the note of interest, who here has heard of compound interest? Yay. This is a very, very powerful tool. In fact, Albert Einstein called it the eighth wonder of the world. That's how cool it is. And the reason that it is cool is because you're basically earning interest on top of interest. You didn't have to do anything in your own money. Who knew? So, you can do these things in savings accounts or CDs. You may not be earning a lot of interest, but you're still earning interest. And as that amount grows in your savings account, it continues to just get bigger and bigger and bigger and amplify itself because of the principle of compound interest. Okay? So, don't think to yourself, oh, I can only put this small amount in a savings account, it won't do anything really. That's not true. It will. It may not make you a millionaire, depending on what you put in there, but it will help you save money and you will borrow money on top of it. And then the final note on this is points and rewards. So uh, not too long ago, credit cards became uh, very unpopular. And so credit card companies have to figure out a way to get everybody to come back to them and leverage them, right? They have to keep all the lights on in those really big buildings. So. They came up with points and rewards. Now, um, these are really great tools that you can use, but you have to be careful. You don't want to put things on a credit card just so you can get points and then get into debt because you're putting stuff on a credit card, right? But a really great way to utilize this is maybe let's say you need to build your credit. You're sitting in a fair credit place and you want to boost it up to good. You could get a credit card, put regular expenses that you have, like your grocery store expenses, on this credit card that you know you can pay off every month so that you don't carry over any debt month to month, and you're also earning points. And then you can take those points and you can apply them to your balance, or you can use them to buy something else that you need. Okay? So um, you can also look at different types of cards that you know, if you know it's going to be on groceries, there are different types of cards that give money back on grocery expenses. So there are lots of really cool things out there. Just make sure you read the fine print. Ways to manage debt. Whether it's good or bad, um, we all have to make sure that we pay back the debt that we owe. And so it's really important that we manage the debt. And these are four tools that I think are really helpful. There are a lot of different ways that you can pay down debt. But these, I would say, are the most popular and the tried and true. So the first is the debt snowball. And this one, you would take all of your debts that you have, and you would look at the lowest amount that you owe. And you would start with that. And you would put the majority of what you can pay each month towards credit card debt 
on that low amount and pay at least the minimum on the others until you pay it off. And then you go to the next, and then the next, and then the next until you've paid it off. The avalanche, on the other hand, you would take those same debts, you would look at them, and you would rank them based on highest interest rate to lowest interest rate. And you would start with the highest interest rate first. You would put the majority of your budget towards paying down debt on that one, pay at least the minimum on the others until you've paid it off. And then you would go down the list from the next to the next until you've paid it off. Now, both of these are really good methods. I wouldn't say that there's one that's better over the other. It really depends on you and what you prefer. If you're the type of person that likes to mark things off of a to-do list, then you might like the snowball one better because you're gonna see quick wins very quickly, quick and easy wins. Um, whereas on the debt avalanche side, that's you're gonna see, it may take longer to hit a win, but when you do, it's gonna be a big win. And um, it's also, you're not gonna end up paying as much in interest in the long run. Another thing that you could look at is, um, let's say you have a credit card and you just can't, you can't get ahead. You can't get past that interest rate. You can't pay enough on the principal to really make a dent. Um, what do you do? Well, you could do what's called a balance transfer, where you find another credit card, which, again, I realize that I'm saying open up another credit card with this, but there is a reason, and that's that you could open up one with a smaller, if not 0% APR for a set period of time. And that would allow you to take the balance from this credit card that you cannot pay and put it on another credit card where you will not have to worry about such a high interest, if any interest at all. The key here is if there is a time frame to this. I think the standard is between 15 and 18 months. You want to make sure that you can pay that debt off in 15 to 18 months. Because come you know, month 16 or month 19, whichever it is, uh, you're going to start seeing that interest again. Okay? But it is a strategy that you can use. And then the fourth is simply practice good habits. If you've, if you've listened so far and you've absorbed things so far and you can put those things into practice, you likely won't find yourself in the situation where you're really struggling with debt um, to this point. And it would be something that you could manage because you would have put that debt specifically as a line item in your budget. Okay. All right, on to number four, retirement fun one. So retirement is such a big deal because as I mentioned at the beginning, we all want to, you know, hang out on the beach or go golfing or travel the world or spend time with our grandkids. All of those things are really exciting, but you can't do them if you don't have the money to retire, right? So a good place to start is just simply have a retirement age goal in mind. The average is 64 if that gives you a good area to start. Some people are younger, some people are older. It really depends on you. Um, I, right now, am sitting at a place where I kind of have a range because I'm not really sure. So if you have a range yourself, just go with the bottom number, the, the quickest one, and build towards that. The second is determine a, a retirement savings amount. So a good rule of thumb is to save 10 to 12 times your annual salary. Again, that's a rule of thumb. You need to base that on your personal situation because this takes into factor things like in retirement maybe you don't have a mortgage maybe your car is paid for maybe your student loans are paid off maybe your kids are out of the house all of those things are really expensive expenses so you need to make sure whatever it is that you want to accomplish by the time that you retire and the life that you want to live that you've taken that into account as you plan for the amount I also would tell you that it's a little bit um, misconceiving sometimes uh, to see a retirement amount because we're not used to seeing savings amounts that have money that high or, or that, that big of an amount. Um, but when you think about 10 to 12 times your annual salary, that's a lot of money. And when you think about what it takes for you to live each year, so what it takes for you to live 2023, and you apply that to when you retire and every year after that that you live, that's a lot of money. And that's what you need to have saved, right? So then the third is how you plan to get to retirement. Um, so there are a couple different ways that we're gonna cover tonight. The first is company-sponsored benefits. 
And the second is individual retirement accounts. There are lots and lots of other strategies, but we'll start small with some of the things that you guys can control, and I'll give you guys some references of things that you can do outside of that. So let's start with company benefits. So um, back in the day, you used to work for the man, you'd stay at the same company forever, and then when you got ready to retire, you would get a pension and a gold watch, and it was great. And then inflation hit, things got a little crazy, and all these companies were going to legislation and they were saying, we can't pay all of this. We can't meet all of these fees. We can't afford to do all of this. What do we do? So they said, okay, we're gonna put this into legislation. We're gonna come up with the ERISA laws. Well, what all of that means is that we're now going to offer uh, defined contribution plans, also known as a 401k or a 403b or a 457. Does any of that sound familiar to anyone? Good. So um, a defined contribution plan or a 401k, for example, is that because you as the employee are contributing to that plan instead of putting all of the burden on the company to do it for you. But what's really cool is that companies said, well, we can still help a little bit. And so some of those companies who are able to do that will match your contribution. So if you have a company that offers a 401k and you're not participating, participate. If you have a company that's offering a 401k and you are participating but you're not meeting the level at which they will meet you for a match, you are throwing away free money. You might as well take that $100 bill that you found on the floor back with loss aversion and light it on fire, okay? It's a very easy way to help build your retirement is to take advantage of those plans and uh, take advantage of the match. Now, if you're lucky to still fall in the defined benefit category where you get a pension, you should pat yourself on the back because those are not common. They're not common at all. And you should be very, very thankful that you have one. I think now most of the companies that offer them are in the government spectrum, um, maybe like school districts, school systems, um, maybe some really large corporate Fortune 500 type companies will offer them, but they're really uncommon. So another little piece, and I'm just gonna touch on this, and I'll have to preface it, I'm not a registered investment advisor, so I'm not giving you investment advice, but purely uh, letting you guys know what this is, because if you have seen a 401k, you will likely see this terminology, and that is target date funds. So if you, um, See this and want you to know what it is. So a target date fund is an age-based retirement investment. It helps you take on more risk when you're young and then you get more conservative over time. And really the best part about it is you don't have to do anything. You can put it on cruise control. So you can say I want to contribute to my 401k. It comes right out of your paycheck or your paycheck. You don't even see it. And then it goes into that target date fund that's going to auto-correct for you over time. Now, I also have to say, that doesn't work for everybody. So um, be mindful that there are other options outside of that. You may prefer to have something more diversified or be in specific um, investments based on your preference and that is A-OK. -okay. The important part is that you're preparing. All right, so the next one is individual retirement accounts, IRA. So you guys have probably heard of an IRA before, maybe you didn't know what that stands for, um, but here it is. And there are two main types, a traditional and a Roth. Uh, a traditional is your pre-tax dollars. So they are taxed at withdrawal um, after 59 and a half, all right? So you cannot take from these without a penalty until after 59 and a half, all right? Uh, Roth, on the other hand, these are dollars that you're contributing that are after tax, okay? So it grows, your money grows tax-free, and no taxes are owed at withdrawal after age 59 and a half, all right? These are just two different strategies, um, and some 401ks offer you the option to contribute to either or both. Uh, it really depends on you. Uh, for me, personally, I like to contribute to both, just to give myself options into the future. But you have to be mindful with a Roth. Um, there are some limitations to that, so if you choose to do only that, you may hit some barriers. Uh, so you just need to check into that and see um, what the parameters are around the 401k offered at your company. 
So I mentioned penalties, and so there are possible penalties. If you take money or withdraw money from one of these IRAs or your retirement account prior to age 59 and a half, you will have a penalty. It'll be 10%, okay? But on the flip side of that, if you, um, if you get to 72, you're gonna have to start taking regular withdrawals. And if you don't at that point, then you'll also hit a penalty, okay? Um, so keep those things in mind as well. Now, um, there are times when you may not be hit with a penalty, okay? And these would be for things like maybe the first time you're buying a home, um, there need to be medical, expensive, uh, medical expenses, premiums, if you've been out of a job for six months or more, things like that. The goal is that you have this money here and we wanna help you in a bind, but um, you need to look into the fine print with those because outside of those situations, taking money, um, if you absolutely had to, would be considered like a hardship loan or a hardship withdrawal. So a hardship loan is gonna be like taking debt. You're just taking it from yourself and having to pay the interest that you put on yourself, I guess, is a way to think of that. So only do it if there really is a, a hardship or if you actually take the withdrawal, you would be hit with that 10% penalty. Okay. We're on number five, so we're getting close, guys. Um, the next one is protection. And really when we think about protecting what matters, we think about insurance. So I'm gonna cover the eight most popular types of insurance so that you guys know which ones might apply to you. And I think the first common misconception is what is insurance protecting? A lot of times we think it's protecting the object of the in insurance. So if I have homeowner's insurance, it's protecting my house, but it's not. Because having car insurance does not protect me from someone rear-ending me. Any type of insurance is protecting your finances, period. That's all it's doing. So it is like a number one supporter of financial wellness. So in going through these, your health insurance, this is the safety net for a medical emergency or your routine medical expenses. Oftentimes, this is offered through your employer as well. And um, I would say that this is probably one of the trickier ones because there are a lot of different variables, a lot of different types, um, and you may have different premiums. You may need to select between a high deductible and a low deductible. It gets really, really confusing. So this is one thing that I would strongly encourage you to leverage your HR department because they're gonna know all the ins and outs of your health insurance and be able to answer that. You can also leverage any financial professional as well. Life insurance, this is protection for the loved ones when you pass. I hate to tell you guys, but we're all gonna die one day. So, it's better that we have, it's better that we have protection put in place for our loved ones, right? So a good rule of thumb when you're thinking about your terms for this is, what's your annual expense now? And think about if that was gone. So what you're contributing for your kids, what you're doing for your family. If that salary or if that income was no longer there, what would need to go in its place? And life insurance is there to help you do that. Homeowner's insurance is an obvious one. It's coverage for your home in the event of a disaster. Uh, automobile insurance, the same. It's a shield in the event of accident or theft. And if you live in Atlanta like I do, it's a regular occurrence. Number five, accident insurance. So this is a safeguard for when one experiences injury or death. So you can kind of look at this one similar to the next one, which is disability insurance, but they are a little bit different. Disability insurance is a preservation of partial income when you are too sick to work. So if you've injured yourself, you're no longer able to work, you could leverage disability insurance. Um, something else to keep in mind. Not every com company is able to offer maternity leave or maternity leave. And so sometimes short-term disability is a great option to help supplement any un income that you might miss if you need to leave for maternity leave when having a child. So if you're thinking about growing a family, talk to your HR department to see if that's something that they offer. Long-term care, this would be security when you have a chronic illness or as you're getting to that point in life where you may need some greater assistance that your family's not able to help you with, okay? That could be things like in-home care or specialized care. And then the final is identity theft. So this would be defense for victims of identity fraud. 
So these are the top ones. There's all, all types of uh, insurance. We have traveler's insurance, umbrella insurance, all different things that you could look into. We also have some pretty rare insurances out there, like alien abduction insurance. Believe it or not, that is something that people do. So if you believe in uh, that the aliens may come get you one day, you may want to get an insurance policy. You also can do body part insurance. So Mick Jagger has insured his middle finger for $1.2 million. And it's not because if he doesn't have it, he can't tell people how he feels. It's because if he doesn't have it, he can't fit his car. So he has that insured to help protect himself because that's his living. I think Tom Jones also has his chest hair insured for like over seven million. So people get crazy with these things and you can too. <laughs> the good thing to know is that when it comes to insurance, there are a lot of things that could impact what you pay, okay? And there are things that you wanna keep in mind. There are different definable risks, your behavior, um, demographics. So I mentioned living in Atlanta earlier with auto insurance. So my, um, my auto insurance is a little bit higher because I live in a city where there are a lot of accidents, okay? And so the likelihood of me getting into an accident is higher, and so the insurance company says, well, you must pay more because you're likely going to have to cash this in someday. So keep that in mind. Also, if you drive a really fast car and it's red, probably gonna have a more expensive insurance. Um, you would wanna look at age, different aspects of your home, if you have a home in Florida, there's bad weather there, you may pay more. Um, there are different negotiated rates, so with the company provided insurances, um, there are different negotiated rates and different packages, and that might play a part in what you're able to take advantage of over maybe some other people. There are a lot of different things, so just make sure that you give insurance the time that it requires to really look through it. And while those were the, the top eight, like I said, there are a lot more. Not everybody is going to need everything. If you don't have a car, you don't need car insurance, right? So pick out the things that make sense for your budget and for your lifestyle and go with that. All right, the next, legacy planning or estate planning. This is a big one because as I mentioned earlier, there will come a day when we are no longer here or we are incapacitated. And so we want to be able to leave that legacy and not just in an aspirational way. We want to be able to pass down our assets and our valuables. So there are four main pieces of legacy planning that I want to touch on. The first is estate plans. Now, you don't actually have to have an estate like Graceland to have an estate plan. Everybody needs, and uh, everybody needs an estate plan and it applies to everyone. It is simply a document detailing how you want your estate to be handled. Okay. When we talk about wills, this is really what most people are referencing, is an estate plan. The will, on the other hand, is a document that's coordinating the distribution of your assets. So think of the estate plan as the map and the will as the directions. Okay, They would work hand in hand. The other is a trust, which um, is a fiduciary arrangement that allows a third party to hold the assets on behalf of the beneficiary. Okay, you hear about this a lot of times when someone wants to leave money to a minor, they put that in a, into a trust so it's managed by someone uh, who has reached an age where they're, or has the level of expertise to be able to manage that level of money, and there are parameters and all different types of things that fall into that. Um, the final is beneficiaries. So this would be the person designated to receive the benefits of the property. And I want to spend a little extra time talking about beneficiaries because there are a lot of common misperceptions with this. Um, so here are a couple rules of thumb and things that you uh, might want to consider. Be sure to update it regularly. I cannot tell you how many times members of Mentor come to us and they say, so uh, I, I accidentally had this other, uh, th this bank account in someone else's name, for example and that gets left to that person. Or there's, there's all different types of things we'll touch on survivorship here in just a second. But just make sure you update it regularly so that it has the people that you want on there. Um, the other is be specific about who you name. Rather than saying I wanna leave this to my kids, say I wanna leave this to Bob, Johnny, and Susie. Because 
kids can get a little vague, especially if you have a mixed family, okay? Um, be careful about the manner of distribution. So let's say you left money to John, Bobby, and Susie, and you and Susie go on a road trip, and you and Susie pass away. Well, how is that money going to be distributed? Is it gonna be a third, a third, a third? And is the third for Susie gonna go to her kids? Or is it gonna be everybody gets equal split? So uh, basically Susie's kids would get the same amount as John and Bobby. There are all different types of distribution man uh, manners, so you would wanna make sure that you have this clearly stated. So I touched a little bit on right of survivorship, and you see that a lot with uh, bank accounts and things of that nature. So um, any time that there is a right of survivorship, that is going to win over a will, every single time. So it doesn't matter if you said, I didn't want that to go to Bobby, I wanted it to go to Jimmy. If it's on the right of survivorship paperwork, it's gonna go to the original one, no matter what your will says. Um, and then think about the responsibility. Think about who you would actually leave some, something to and, um, and who that person is, okay? So if they're a minor, are they really in a place where they can make decisions? Um, if they have special needs, you may want to assign a guardian to then help on behalf of that person. And you guys would be surprised to hear there are people who leave their estates to their dogs or to trees really really wild stuff so be super duper specific and I would say um, even though these may seem like simple documents take them seriously and maybe don't try to do them all by yourself there are a lot of people who are very skilled in putting these together and the more complex your instructions uh, the more uh, margin for error that there will be and that means that your wishes will not come to life after you pass okay all right we're on to the last one, wealth. So when we think of wealth, oftentimes we think of worth. Okay, but they are two different things. Wealth is the accumulation of valuable economic resources in terms of real goods or money value. Net worth, on the other hand, is the most common measure of wealth, which is determined by the total value of wealth minus all of your debt. Okay, so again, we talked about you can have one thing in the bank account, but what you owe in debt is going to be taken away from that, okay? But net worth is still a good thing to keep the tabs of. It's a good benchmark for where you stand in life. And a lot of people actually use that um, for a good determination for um, their stretch to retirement. Okay, with wealth, a lot of people think of investing. So I'm going to give you guys a crash course, Investing 101, and kind of cover some of the basics. Again, something that could be an entire lecture in and of itself. Um, so stocks, we hear about the stock market, so stocks. It's a type of security that gives you, a stockholder, a share of ownership in a company. Simple as that. So you see in the newspaper, you see on the news, something about Coca-Cola or Apple. If you invest in a stock, you're in essence investing in ownership in that company. Now, not to the level where you're making the decisions, what they do, but enough to where you reap the benefits if they are successful. A bond, on the other hand, is a promise by a borrower to pay a lender their principal and interest on a loan. And these are typically issued by governments and municipalities. So the stock market. Sometimes I think the stock market feels very big and scary, okay? But it's really a very simplistic thing. The stock market is the stock exchange where traders and investors buy and sell the shares of publicly traded companies, okay? So that's just the place where they conduct the business with the stocks, okay? Um, and then you'll hear a lot in investing about a diversified portfolio. And really all that means is that you're practicing spreading out your investments instead of putting all your eggs in one basket. In other words, you wouldn't want to invest everything in say a company called Enron, and then they go under, and then you lose everything, like the people of Enron did a long time ago. Okay, you might wanna um, be more conscious and spread those things out. What are the indexes? So you hear about S&P 500, the Dow Industrial, and NASDAQ. What are those? They're not just big fancy words, they stand for something. So the S&P 500 stands for the Standard & Poor 500, okay? It's the top 500 companies 
that are publicly traded with stocks. The Dow Industrial, on the other hand, that I believe is the top 20. Um, that is the top 20 of the uh, industrial company. So back in the day when it was uh, run, um, basically that was at the industrial revolution and so all these big industries were starting to, to trade. Nowadays you have companies like Google on there and I don't know that we would necessarily think of that as industrial. Um, but, and then the final one is NASDAQ which is predominantly technology. Quick note on the market, that is that it's gonna go up and it's gonna go down. It's gonna go up again after that and then down again after that. So we all hear the saying, if it bleeds, it leads. But I would really encourage you guys not to take on that bleeding yourself, okay? Um, because it's going to change, um, there's no point in panicking or freaking out. Talk to a financial professional, have them explain it to you and go from there. And then uh, on average, historically, the annual return is about 11%, okay? So um, even though we didn't finish the year last year at 11%, and we won't this year either, that's a good rule of thumb for averages. Okay, these are some traditional ways. I'm gonna skim through them because I think I'm running up on time. Um, so some ways that you can build wealth are traditional investing, um, which we just discussed. Other investments might be real estate or small business. So if you um, uh, see a home that you might want to invest in, you know, Airbnb, VRBO, those have become great businesses, which lead me to the third, which is gig economy. We're in a perfect gig economy. That means that you could start a, a, a side hustle and people are going to be open to working with you uh, because of that. Maybe it's that you have a house on Airbnb. Maybe that's that you're a really good painter and you sell your art at the local festival. Whatever it is, it's another way that you can build wealth. And the final one is automate your savings. Make it easy. Have that direct deposit through your 401k, come straight out of your paycheck, and then you don't even have to think about it. Okay. So, um, to recap the seven, we had spending, saving, debt, retirement, insurance, estate planning, and wealth. All right, it's a lot. I know I covered a lot. So. Um, resources that you have available to you outside of tonight. Financial professionals. You guys are really fortunate in that there are quite a few that are sitting right outside, okay? I'd encourage you to talk to them, pick up something from their booth, reach out to them, especially if they're local. These are your friends. These are um, people here in your community that care about your success. Outside of that, you have counselors and coaches. So talk to your school counselor, your college advisor, your coach, maybe an HR manager at work. You also have friends and family. So parental figures, siblings, um, maybe even a church group or a club that you're a part of. Those are also great resources. Um, so another resource, shameless, very quick plug. Uh, but um, I, I'd be remiss if I didn't at least tell you guys that this is predominantly what my business does. Our goal is to help people by educating them and uh, giving them the resources to put that education into practice, okay? So um, typically we work with companies in their HR department. Uh, so tonight I'm gonna view you guys as a company, okay? And I'm going to offer to you what we offer to them, which is um, the ability to take part in our program if you would like, okay? So what that looks like is um, different membership levels. Each and every one of you could sign up for a free online profile today. No gimmicks, nothing else asked for. And you would be able to have access to educational content, uh, account connectivity, so that automated digital budget I told you about, right there for you, free tool that would allow you to take, um, take a look at your spending and track your habits. Um, if you'd like to have a more premium experience, maybe talk with a mentor one-on-one, -on -one, have a more hands-on, learning experience, uh, maybe really pour into your financial journey. That's something that you could do, and because you are now a company that I'm working with, you can use this code and get 30% off. We do have some really exciting things coming down the pipe this summer, such as bite-sized learning. So if you've ever used a program like Babbel or Duolingo, we're going to have something very similar to that. Instead of learning a language, you're learning about finance. We'll also have enhanced mentor connections and a community of people to pull from. All very exciting. 
Okay. I, I think she touched on my podcast earlier. If all of that sounds like no fun to you, you could at least check out the podcast. It's got some pretty great stuff. We're in our third season. Um, so uh, maybe that's something that you could listen to. We're in all the usual places. All right. Thank you so much. I, uh, I really appreciate you guys being here. It was really wonderful for me. Um, having grown up here, I've been on the stage hundreds of times with the Andalusia Ballet, but being back here tonight was especially um, uh, warm for me because uh, I'm getting to share another of my passions with all of you. So thank you for listening very much. I don't know if we have time for Q&A at this point. Okay, she says we do. So if you guys have any questions, I'd love to take those. I have a question not specifically about this, but are you are we gonna get the PowerPoint sent to our email budget so we can share that with other people? Is that possible? Sure. I'd be happy to get it or I can work with uh, I can work with LBW to make sure that you guys get it. I'd be more than happy to get that to you guys. Absolutely. Yes. I understand you went to some school today. Can you share a little bit what you talked about? Oh. Age appropriate. I unfortunately did not get to go to the schools, which makes me so sad, but I am hoping uh, to be able to do that at a later date. Um, but what I would have talked about is kind of the, the skinnier, softer version of what we went through tonight, uh, really honing in on budgeting and spending and talking about what people might be able to do, youngsters might be able to do, let's say if they had a summer job, um, what they might be able to do with that money to start practicing those good habits. So I do have some resources out there for those of you who are parents, I have a couple of books. Um, that talks specifically about how you can talk to your kids about money. So I'd be happy to pass those out. I also have, for any of you um, who may just want a little more insight on kind of the basics of budgeting and spending, I have another book uh, for a guy actually that works on my team that I'd be happy to give you guys. Any other questions? Perfect, okay. I'm going to pass it back over. I will be um, at our little booth after if you have any other questions. Also, my information is here. I know that talking about finances is really hard. And so maybe you're sitting in a place where you don't really want to ask a question in front of everybody, and that's A-OK. -okay. Please feel free to reach out to me. I'd be happy to help. All right. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>
for ticket number 374. Drum roll, please. The winner is ticket number 373. Nobody? Oh. Okay. Drum roll, please. Another drum roll, please. The winner is 350.